Hello there. It's lovely to see so many of you here. I'm just going to take those out because I'm getting an echo in my ears. Um, I'm Alan Willison. I'm the chairman of the Hartford Astronomy Group and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to tonight's meeting. We've got a lovely big audience here at the university and I know we've got quite a lot of people also on Zoom so a big hello to you as well. Very nice to see you all here. Um, can I just ask, is this your first meeting for any of you? One or two of you? Fantastic. Well, make sure you don't go away at the end of the meeting without saying hello to myself or some of the other committee members who are around here. We are a friendly group and we do like to get to know you as well. And that goes the same to the people on Zoom. Um, make sure that you say hello and uh, we'll try and get a chat to you as well. For those of you in the university, a um, couple of housekeeping things to begin with. The first one is that we're not expecting to practice the fire alarm. So if it does go off, please exit the safe ways out, gather on the car park and we'll just make sure that everybody is safe and sound. The next thing to remind you about, if you haven't already and you, or you might want to find out later on, toilets are just outside those doors there opposite where Tony was logging you in. And the last thing to ask you is if you've got a mobile phone, could you set it to silent or vibrate or whatever you do so that it doesn't go off? Very opportune for me to do it as well. <laughs> OK, for those of you on Zoom, it's lovely to see you here as well. Um, the only things to ask you to do is try to keep your fingers away from the space bar because otherwise that will possibly turn your microphones on and other people will hear all sorts of strange messages. So other than that, you just sit back, nice glass of wine in your hand and a few chocolate biscuits. You have a lovely time. The format of the evening is that after these few announcements, um, John Fraser will give you a talk about the night sky and that will last about 15 minutes and following that I will introduce tonight's speaker Roger O'Brien who's going to talk about distances in space. Throughout either of the talks um, when we get to the end of them you can ask questions. Those of you on Zoom if you want to ask a question perhaps you could enter it into the chat facility and we'll make sure that we read it out at this end. So, that's all I've got to say. Oh, I should have said after the main speech, I'll just give you a little um, winding up bit about future meetings and so on. So that's enough from me. I'm now going to pass you over to John and his presentation. So, give John a big hand. Right, brilliant. So I'll quickly go through the news and the night sky. Well, I'll try and go quickly. Okay, so winter is coming, and with winter comes Orion. Now, Orion is rising about midnight, and uh, first thing you're going to see is the bow of the hunter going up by about 4.15. Sirius is up, so the whole of Orion's up, and Canis Major is about to come up. Now, probably a few of you are thinking, why are you telling us about Orion? You're probably all very, well, not all of you, many of you very, very familiar with Orion. It did strike me that we have a lot of people in the group, some of them may be new. If you're new to astronomy, if you want to learn your way around the night sky, Orion is a great place to start. First constellation uh, to learn. It's wonderfully bright, brightest constellation in the sky. You can see it even in the most light polluted sites. Easy to pick out and it's really useful for finding your way around. If you zoom out a little bit, you've got uh, that's a different plan. But I'll, is that one? Okay. So, Orion is a beautiful way of finding your way around the night sky. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so, and I know many of you will know this, but if you look at the belt of Orion, lovely line, points up straight at one of the closest goblin clusters to the, uh, to the Earth. Uh, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, if you've got good eyesight, I could do it as a kid, I can make out individual stars. It's supposed to be seven, there's actually several hundred, probably several thousand. You're going through the Hyades, which is the other very close globular cluster of the Earth. You've got Taurus over here, which is one of the few constellations that looks like 
what it's supposed to be a bull, lovely and bright out of Alderon, I think. Uh, over here, also nice and easy to see. Behind that, you've got uh, Gemini the Twins with Castor and Pollux over here. Nice, distinct constellation. You can also start spotting it. Down here, you can't see it. You will in a minute. You've got a uh, Leo coming in. So you, it's a really nice constellation to spot and find your way around that sky. So if you're new to astronomy, if you're interested in that, it is really, really worth learning this, this constellation. And it's going to get up earlier every evening through the winter and sorry every every night through the winter it will come up earlier and you'll be able to uh, see it by the early evening by next january february okay so the moon moon currently is first quarter it was actually a relief i got in the car today so oh yeah first quarter i have got that right so it's first quarter at the moment it goes <coughs> goes through all of the cycles we've got uh, close ish encounters with saturn the pleiades jupiter and mars throughout the month it's about six degrees or so from them, and for reference, six degrees is roughly a hand's width at arm's length. Okay, we've got a partial lunar eclipse on the 18th. It's not a very good one. Uh, only about half the moon's going to be covered, and uh, uh, half the moon's covered. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how clear it'll be, but if you're out, it'd be worth looking at. Okay, so Mercury. Mercury's sitting below Leo. Uh, always say this, do not look at Mercury with a telescope, with binoculars, even low powered ones while the sun is in the sky. If you manage to catch the sun with them, your life in astronomy is not going to be very long lived after that. Really don't do it. Incredibly dangerous. So it's coming up about, about 5 a.m., sitting below Leo. It's fairly bright, minus, minus 0.2, little lost in the glare. We'll lose it about the 20th and it's going to go into superior conjunction on the 30th. This will appear around the sun, coming back later. And if you look here, again, we've got this nice grouping. So this is Taurus going to the top of the screen. We've got Gemini, uh, Orion over here and down here, Mercury just sitting below Leo. Another constellation looks like what it's supposed to look like. That's Cancer in between, but... I, I can't find that with my naked eye without <laughs> knowing it's between them. Okay. So Venus, Venus is really bright. Venus is minus four. It's going to be a wonderful evening star. Comes up at sunset. It's travelling through Virgo at the bottom of the screen uh, down here and moving through to uh, Libra. So Mars and Jupiter. Mars and Jupiter are coming up about quarter past 11 for Mars, uh, for Jupiter rather. It's sitting in the horns of the bull in Taurus. Really bright. I mean, minus two, three, five. It'll be the brightest thing around. Uh, and then Mars, uh, not, not as bright, 0.66. You'll be able to see the reddish colour. And uh, if we look there, you see him again. You probably saw it the last time. Sitting in the two constellations just above uh, Orion, although you'll easily spot Jupiter, it'll be the brightest thing you see. Okay, on the 24th, I think on the first slide actually, so the 23rd, I think the 24th, right, we've got that six degree width between the Moon and Jupiter. All right, I, I, I always like seeing those, I maybe I'm just odd, I always like seeing those, and over the next night it'll head close to the Mars. I actually wrote down it's five degrees from Mars, but that to me looks further. All right. Okay. So Saturn. Saturn is sitting in Aquarius. It's coming up pretty much at sunset. I think it's already in the sky. Slightly brighter than Mars. So pretty good. Right. Hit opposition on the eighth. Uh, and opposition is about the best time to look at uh, look at the moons of uh, look at the moons of Saturn. You can see the larger one. This picture was taken by uh, by Stephen on the 8th, I think he said. He said it was bad seeing conditions, but yeah. Uh, wonderful picture. We've got Titan, Rhea, Dione, and I can't actually read that one. Thank you, I couldn't think of the name. Sitting beautifully there, lovely. Unfortunately, at the moment, Saturn is, the rings are fairly edge on. They're going to be for a while. 
but it, it's still worth seeing and it's a really good time to see it when it's in opposition okay uh, Saturn Mars and Jupiter form this line across the sky with towards the point out but it's about a quarter of the sky I'm not actually sure how clear that will be all right Uranus is sitting up in Taurus 5.7 it's fairly dim if you've got good eyes and a dark sight you might be able to see it it's coming up before Jupiter an hour or so before Jupiter it's just off the Pleiades that's going to be about two finger width from the Pleiades so it might be worth trying it's always worth trying could be a good good thing to try and have a look at all right uh, Neptune ne Neptune is rising at uh, sunset in the east it's fairly close to Saturn that's it that's another five six seven degrees off it's that opposition on the 20th it's too dim you're not going to see that with your naked eye you, without you'll need a scope even in the dark it's like not unless you've got incredible vision uh, hopefully you have but it's, it's a great month actually because all eight of the planets are visible in the evening sky at some point okay so this is the news there's been a lot of news I, I've actually cut this down to try and keep this to time so these are just the ones that really struck me as worth saying something about so a couple of days ago China announced uh, Taiwan 3 as a Mars return mission uh, and they say they're going to launch in 2028 now if they do launch in 2028 this thing will get samples back from Mars before the ones that uh, Perseverance has been dropping off they'll beat NASA this is, Mar this is China and China are not Elon Musk there's a chance they'll hit this date. There's a very good chance they'll hit this date. It's not something they've just invented. So there could be real Martian rocks on, uh, on Earth for them to sample. I don't know if everyone remembers. Taiwan 1, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Taiwan 1 uh, was the lander that landed about the same time as Perseverance. Mar uh, the Chinese managed to get it to Mars with an orbiter and a lander first go very famously Mars eats landers for breakfast but they did it uh, Tywin 2 is a near-earth uh, asteroid supposed to be visited next year Tywin 4 was also announced and that's going to Jupiter in 2030 and I think they intend to crash into one of the satellites and I can't remember which one I didn't write it down okay Starliner We've all heard about Starliner, and I'm not going to go into any depth on it. There's just two things I wanted to mention about this. One was that there was utter nonsense talked about the astronauts being stranded in space. Uh, they were never stranded. NASA could always get them back, uh, as they've shown. And I thought uh, Randall Monroe's cartoon in XKCD sort of summed up the ludicrous situation. And it, I find it very depressing, the level of science communication that our press do okay the second thing <clears throat> is NASA are almost certainly going to persevere with Starliner despite its endless problem NASA are committed to having two mechanisms to get to low earth orbit uh, and they have actually been justified because if they'd only gone for one mechanism to get to low earth orbit it would have been Starliner it wouldn't have been the Dragon that was their sort of backup plan so they will keep going Admittedly, the International Space Station has only got about six years of scheduled life left. I assume something will be replacing it, but I would expect them you, you to see more launches of Starliner in the fairly new future. Right, New Glenn, which is Blue Origin's new rocket, it's a sort of Falcon 2 competitor, a lot bigger than Falcon 2, was supposed to launch in October for the escapade mission to Mars. That's been delayed till the spring. It's quite curious, and I don't understand this. Part of the justification was the cost and the risk. And one of the costs was, if they couldn't launch on schedule, they had to defuel it and then refuel it, and they added this cost in. And they said it was cost overruns. But September, uh, sorry, spring, when they're scheduled, when they say they're gonna launch it, is beyond the launch window for Mars. So they will need more fuel to launch it. So it's another curious decision by NASA that I don't quite understand. New Glenn, should launch next month it's doing a uh, demo launch 
Normally, new rockets do launch as a demo with a, with a demo load. Uh, so it's still worth going up. Now, I don't know if anyone follows Tim Dodd, who goes under the moniker of the Everyday Astronaut on YouTube. He's recently done two videos where he goes around Blue Origins uh, factory with uh, Jeff Bezos as his guide. And it's quite interesting if, you, if you're into that sort of thing to watch him do that. Okay, the other thing, been in the news a lot, Polaris Dawn. This, this is, there's a lot of nice things about Polaris Dawn. They went up on a, on a Falcon, on, uh, in a Dragon on a Falcon. It's the first civilian spacewalk they're going to do. I believe they're going to do it tomorrow. Uh, they're using a new uh, spacesuit. Only one of the members is going out of the, on the spacewalk, but there is no airlock on a Dragon. So the other three will have to be in uh, spacesuits as well. I think Gemini, well, I know Gemini never had an airlock. I'm pretty sure Apollo never had airlock. So it, it's not that unusual, but this will be the first civilian spacewalk and it will be the furthest anyone has gone from Earth since Apollo 17. Uh, okay, so next month, we've got a meteor shower just before the next meeting. Might be good. They're always disappointing, so... Okay, we hit the autumn equinox on the 22nd, so the, the sun crosses the equator on the 22nd, and the nights really are drawing in. There's an annular solar eclipse on October the 2nd, so that's the ring of fire eclipse. I don't know if anyone's going to see it. Uh, it's only the Pacific and southern Chile and Argentina, I think, uh, pa uh, Patagonia. So I'm not sure anyone around here is going to see it. Okay. Uh, Europa Clipper launched is due for the 10th of October. Now this is NASA's flagship mission to Europa, which is going to do several flybys of Europa and is looking for good landing sites and the possibility of supporting life there. Should get there about 2030. Right, now... Oh! That wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> no, it, sk it skipped the picture. <laughs> it skipped the picture. Okay. So there's been quite a lot of pictures from the astrophotography group over the summer. Uh, incredible, as always. Now, what I've done is I pretty much randomly picked one from each person who contributed. If, if I've missed someone, I really apologise. It wasn't intentional. Uh, I, let me know and I'll do double next time to make up for you. So this is, this is a nice one actually from Stephen, who actually, I don't know if I said it, he did the Saturn picture that I used earlier with the moons. This is the fireworks galaxy, and this is a galaxy in the Virgo supercluster, about 45 million light years. I'm sorry, I forgot my glasses again, so I'm struggling to read my own notes. 25 million light years from Earth. It's a double bar barred face on spiral galaxy. Now, there's been something like 10 supernovas in the last 120 years, which is why, why it's nicknamed the Fireworks Galaxy. This sits between uh, Cygnus and Cepheus, so it's just here. So this one's from Martin, a lovely one of the uh, Cygnus loop. This, is, uh, this sits just if I remember rightly, just about here, uh, in Cygnus the Swan, which actually is another good constellation to know. Uh, this is a supernova remain, and it's a shell of gas expanded out, uh, thrown out by the supernova. If you see this in uh, X-ray, it does actually form a complete loop. This is, I love the colours in that one. It's lovely. Okay, from Kevin Noble, this is the uh, elephant, the elephant trunk nebula. It's, it's an interstellar gas and dust sitting here near Cepheus. I've got to say, I didn't actually grab the pictures because they were all in the same area of sky. That just happened to be that. Uh, this is the Elephant Trunk Nebula. It's part of a bigger nebula, much bigger nebula, which has the catchy title of IC1396. Ooh, that's all right. 
the, uh, the, get, the glowing edge here is actually being illuminated by a massive star that's ionizing the gas. And this is an interstellar nebula. Uh, sorry, interstellar nebula, obviously, an interstellar nebula. It's, an inter it's a stellar nursery. There are stars forming in this. It's about two and a half thousand light years from Earth. Now, I don't know if this is going to relate to Roger's talk afterwards. But they've only just revised that in the last few years. Apparently, they used things about 500 light years out from Earth. And uh, they, they've made better measurements now, or better calculations. This is a lovely picture by Peter. Uh, great picture. So this, this is a uh, planetary nebula, KN45. Uh, this is... A, the fate of our sun, once our sun finishes burning all the hydrogen it can, it will start fu fusing the helium, and uh, that's done at much hotter temperature. It throws out, causes the outer atmosphere of the star to be expelled in this shell. They don't last very long, a million years, something like that, maybe two or three million years, short for us, uh, for us something in space. But they, fantastic images. Peter's notes says it took him a little over 45 hours of exposure to get this image. It looks like a bubble blown in space. It is wonderful. I've got to say, I can't even show you where this is. It, it, I'm not 100% certain what part of the sky it is. So I'm not going to say, oh, it's over here. It's, I think it's near Cygnus as well, but I couldn't guarantee it. It's absolutely fantastic. He does seem to take some very, very technically difficult pictures. Okay, so that's the last one. I'm hoping there's no questions, but I've got Roger sitting around here. He can probably answer them for me. Has anyone got any questions? Excellent. How do I turn that time thing off? There you are. You've got away. There you are. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Going to say thank you very much indeed, John. Yeah. And of course, congratulations to all the photographers who were taking those lovely pictures. They're absolutely superb. It's always lovely to share those with us. Now, 20 years ago, I had a little bit of paper pushed through my letterbox telling me about an evening class over at the SEAL school in Hartford. And it was about beginning astronomy. At the time, I thought, what a lovely thing to do, to escape from the day job and go and do something completely different. And so I went along to that, and so there were several other people there, all very lovely people to speak with. And the person giving the talk was this chap called Roger O'Brien, over here. Well, we enjoyed that session of talks so much that we asked, well, Roger actually offered to do yet another set at the sea. Also, we had two sets of talks. And following those, we'd enjoyed them so much, we asked Roger, would he come back and take us a little bit further? And so a group of us carried on, and we moved from the SEAL school to the cricket club in um, Hartingford Bury. And then we moved to Letty Green as our club was getting larger. And then we moved from Letty Green's scout hut over to the cricket club just by the QE2 hospital, the old QE2, or the new one, same place. And we outgrew that. And then we moved on to the Welling Garden golf course, the posh one, you know, Nick Faldo one. And we outgrew that, the club was getting larger and larger. And then we went to Panshanger, to their golf course. And that was very good as well. And of course then Covid hit us. But we didn't lose contact, we carried on with Zoom. And we carried on talking to people. And we got chatting to the university. And they said we could uh, come here which is absolutely fabulous because the amount of space we've got here. And if we outgrow it, they've got even larger lecture rooms. So we are here to stay. But the important part was right at the beginning when we were inspired 
to look at astronomy in whatever way we wanted to. I remember Roger saying, what do you want to get out of the course? And we had all sorts of suggestions put forward. I remember mine was to learn about some of the constellations. Others had got ideas about nebula, others wanted to know deep space, cosmology, the whole gamut of things which make up astronomy. And Roger led us on for several years, and then we decided to sort of not break away, but go larger and make our club. And it is what it is today. Without that inspiration at the start, we wouldn't be here. The volunteers wouldn't be volunteering and we wouldn't be offering these. So I'm extremely pleased to be able to introduce you to our president, because we thought he deserved that title. You haven't been on any presidential TV discussions recently, have you? No. Um, if Camelot Harris wants to drag me onto the telly, I'll be perfectly happy. Okay, that's the side you'd like to be on, is it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, I don't fancy Trump's haircut, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll not go down that road. <laughs> Any further. Sorry for bringing this up, but please, would you give a big warm welcome to Roger, who's the father of the Hartford Astronomy Group. Over to you, Roger. Actually, Alan's overstated the case considerably, as uh, you probably worked out. I mean, I was no more than a facilitator. They provided all the enthusiasm. I just sort of wandered along and said, what do you want to do? And they said, this, 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 and this. So, OK, we did that, you know. And that's... I mean, I, I'm, I'm not knocking it. Uh, I was um, very pleased with it as a class. And I am immensely proud to have been involved in the birth of this lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is it's quite a thing to have uh, taken part in. And uh, so, anyway, here I am, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, if I can remember what I was going to say, because I've forgotten all of it by now. I don't know if you find the same thing when you write a presentation. By the time you finish writing it, you've forgotten what it's Anyway, a ladder into space and time. Sort of posh title. I mean, you may, you may not notice the ladder, but we'll have a go. Um, so let's have a look at some big numbers and some big units first. Uh, one billion. Now, we were talking about this. Um, Leon and Alan and I were talking about this earlier. The, what we mean by a billion is not the old-fashioned English billion. It's the American billion or the scientific billion, 1,000 million, which is a big enough number in all case, you know. But just to sort of have a look at some big numbers first off, I mean, let's take 1 billion kilometres, or as it says there, 55 and a half light minutes, which is just over six and a half astronomical units. Remember, the astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So that is rather farther than Jupiter is from the Sun. Jupiter is only about 5.2 AU from the Sun, but not so far out as Saturn, which is nearly 10. OK, so we've done a billion kilometres. Let's do a billion light years. That's around 300 million parsecs. Now, I'm well aware that most amateur astronomers prefer light years to parsecs but the professionals prefer parsecs to light years. Um, you can make a case one way or the other. Uh, I have a nasty suspicion that astronomers, professional astronomers like parsecs because nobody else knows what they're talking about and they can feel smug and superior. I might be doing them a, a, a disservice, I doubt it. Um, anyway. 300 million parsecs is 63 trillion astronomical units. A trillion, this is again the American trillion, so that's a million million. I mean, if you can imagine 63 trillion, good luck to you, I can't. Um, or, as it says there, you know, 9,500 million trillion kilometres. Completely meaningless numbers. 
But I remember um, when we were doing the talks at the SEAL school, um, one of the, the lady students said, oh, what I really come along for is the big numbers. She said, I, I just like the, the mind-boggling aspect of it. Fair enough. It's all astronomy. And that distance is halfway to the nearest quasar. The nearest quasar has the wonderfully romantic name of 3C273, um, which is the, third, the 273rd object in the third Cambridge catalogue. Incidentally, if you want a bit of a laugh, you can look up the history of the Cambridge catalogues. The first two were not terribly successful. In fact, some of the objects in them don't exist. <laughs> artifacts of dodgy analysis and so on. So, but the third Cambridge catalogue hit the, hit the jackpot and virtually all of the early quasars were in that catalogue and it probably did more to put radio astronomy on the map than almost anything else that's happened. I know if I say that anywhere near Jodrell Bank I'll get lynched but uh, you know, Jodrell Bank's done its own good stuff anyway. Incidentally, if you've ever been there, it is well worth having a look at. Absolutely amazing bit of engineering. So is Cambridge, of course, which is a lot nearer. Now, don't forget, distance implies time. The speed of light is the ultimate speed. I don't know how many of you are science fiction fans, and if you are, you're probably used to the idea that you can sort of nip over to the Andromeda galaxy in about half a week. Um, yeah, well, I'll believe it when I see it coming up. Um, I'm taking the speed of light as the ultimate speed. I might not like it, but that's the way it goes. So that means the Earth's orbit is about 17 light minutes across. And if we look at that 2 billion, year, two billion light year distant quasar, we are seeing it as the, it was when the light left it. And it's taken two billion years to get here. So when that light left that quasar, there was no life on land, on the Earth. It was all single-celled organisms in the sea. And you put, oh, someone like me wouldn't have even been able to tell whether they were plants or animals or whatever, you know. They hadn't learned how to c combine to make more complex organisms or anything like that. They hadn't even learned how to make jellyfish, as far as we know. Two billion years, it's a long time. It's nearly half the age of the Earth. But remember, the Earth is only one third of the age of the universe. The age of the universe being about 13.8 billion years. Anyway, so that's sort of add a little go at the time side, which we'll keep coming back to. Now, I'm talking about distances. And I can remember this phrase, the height of the moon. I never had a clue what it meant to look it up. Because what they actually meant was how far up the moon is, how far away it is. And that was the first distance that was estimated. Now, the trick was that you, you observed something, an eclipse, an occultation, something which would be, would be happening at the same time, whoever saw it. And then with luck, if you got two people seeing it, they would see the moon in slightly different positions, and you, you might know the distance between the two, and you could, by a bit of triangulation, work out how far away the moon was. That is a lot more difficult than I'm making it sound. And one of the problems, of course, was that navigation, we're talking about uh, before Common Era stuff, navigation was in a much more primitive state than it is now. And distances were often very, very poorly known. So the height of the moon was estimated. And in fact, the best versions of it that have come down from the ancient Greeks, assuming we've got their um, unit, which was the stadium, assuming we worked that out correctly, 
the height of the moon was generally underestimated by at least 10%. Nevertheless, they got the right sort of idea. They were in the right ballpark anyway. But actually, the height of the moon doesn't really do anything. You know, the, the Earth and the Moon are so close together astronomically that it doesn't really help. It doesn't get you any further. Anyway, there's the Earth to moon and the Moon to scale. I'll put in 100,000 kilometres so you can just see that it's nearly, nearly four times the distance of that. We use the kilometre still on the Earth-Moon scale. And it's, it's a big enough unit, but you need a more than a third of a million of them to get to the moon. That's quite a big number. So we're going to need a better unit for estimating the size of the solar system. And that better unit was the astronomical unit. Now that has actually a very noble lineage because before telescopes before Tycho Brahe made observing into a, a real accurate science, nobody had the faintest idea how far away anything was, except possibly the moon. And so we had to have some means of estimating distance. Now remember, they didn't have calculators. They didn't have laptops. So if you wanted to work out an answer to something and it involved calculation, you had to sit there with a slate and a chalk because paper was too expensive to waste it on doing rough calculations. And of course you had to do your calculations twice to make sure you haven't made too many mistakes or get someone else to do it in parallel. And the way they did most of them was not to literally calculate. They used geometry. Now, this actually helped me at school because I hated geometry. I hated geometry. I hated coordinate geometry. I hated analytical geometry. Then I read about this lunatic called Kepler Incidentally, if you want to laugh, Kepler is well worth reading about. Mad as a hatter. But most of his work was done with geometry. If you think back, I mean, remember, you may have hated geometry as much as I did. But remember, they could nearly always tell you whether an area was the same size as another area or whether it was bigger or smaller. You might not know how big it was, but you could tell whether it was bigger or smaller. You could use an area as a means of multiplying two numbers together. You didn't know what those numbers were, but you could get useful answers. So they used the size of the Earth's orbit as the astronomical unit. And certainly by Kepler's time, all of the naked eye planets were distanced in terms of the astronomical unit but nobody knew what the astronomical unit was. It was just one astronomical unit. Nobody knew what it was in stadia or miles, or nobody had invented kilometres yet. And then along came Edmund Halley, <coughs> one of the great heroes of astronomy. Also a very interesting guy. He was a spy. Uh, he was captain of a naval ship. Um, he invented one of the first useful uh, tables of, um, I can't think of the right word, when you're, when you're doing uh, life assurance, that's it, assurance tables, you know, um, for certain, you know, everyone's going to die, so you, you need to know how many people are going to pop their clogs in a given time and all that. Halley invented one of the first tables for that. Um, Yes, he was a spy when he went to the Baltic. What else did he do? Oh, he persuaded Newton to publish the uh, Principia. I think he was the only person who could persuade Newton to do anything. You know, Newton was a cantankerous, strange 
character. But Halley seems to have had this sort of blessed style. He could, com he could get on with most people except Flamsteed. He and Flamsteed didn't like each other. That's another thing where astronomy is always good fun. I don't know if you've noticed, is the one number of feuds. You, know, you, can't, you can't read about astronomy without finding a good feud available nearly, all, nearly anywhere. But Halley, to get back onto the track, Halley suggested that this forthcoming transit of Venus in 1769 would be an ideal opportunity to work out the astronomical unit. The reason is that Venus is a relatively large planet, so it's quite easy to see against the Sun when it transits over the Sun. And it's only about 72% of the Earth's distance from the Sun. So that means it's not too far off the middle. So you can use light rays and draw similar triangles and do some nice simple geometry. And if you know what you're doing, you can work out the astronomical unit. Now I'm going to tell you one of the ways that the calculations was done. Now the point was that different observers would see the transit differently. So you could use those differences to divide up the space and work out what was going on. So Cook, James Cook, Lieutenant James Cook, RN, was appointed to command the Endeavour Bark. I don't know if you've ever seen this at uh, the National Maritime Museum. They've got a model of it. And on the quay side next to it, they've got all the people and all the stores that had to go into that ship. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I mean, I, I just stood there. How the hell did they get that lot in that little ship? <laughs> and, and I managed to work the ship as well, you know. Anyway, the, one of the reasons they had to send Cook, by the way, because Cook was the, the ace navigator, they knew where Tahiti was, and Tahiti was sort of the furthest out place where the transit was going to be seen. But they had to send their best navigator because he was the only one they were sure would find Tahiti in time. He was so good, he got there with two months to spare. I mean, this guy was the great navigator. And you can see there's this 243-year cycle of uh, Venus transits. And you get two transits with an eight-year gap, then you get a 121-year gap or a 105-year gap, and then you get another eight-year gap with two transits. This means that you can be left without a single transit, as we were in the whole of the 20th century. Not one transit of Venus. So if you think back to 8th of June 2004, that was the first transit after a completely empty century of transits. Because it had all been done by then. I don't know about you, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that transit. It was a lovely hot day, nice clear sky, and you could see this sharp black dot on the sun. Terrific. And here you see a picture from a place called Wynyards and uh, it's in southern England, it's in the northern hemisphere and this picture here is an overlay of several observations and there we are pointing out where they are. In fact there's a lot more on there but they don't come up in this, um, this, in this picture. Well, at least they don't come up clearly, but they, they follow. I don't Can you see that cursor? Yeah, well, they follow along that line. If you, if you look at the original picture, you can see several more. And simultaneously, they were doing the same thing in Pretoria. Now, you've got to remember, Pretoria is in South Africa. And they're all upside down down there. They don't realise. Perhaps you shouldn't tell them, but they are. So, of course, they see the sun the other way up, which is why this picture looks a little confused. <laughs> and you have to allow for all that. Now, there's a few things in the background. I think most of you will probably be familiar with the idea of maximum elongation. That is, when Venus or Mercury 
is at its greatest distance as you look at it on the sky. For Mer Mercury, I think it's about 28 degrees. For Venus, it's more like 42. That's a familiar number, isn't it? 42. Douglas Adams, isn't it? Anyway, the point is that when this angle here, which I've called theta, I don't know why angles are called theta. It's a strange thing. But anyway, hell. If you look from the Earth to the Sun and Venus, you've got a triangle. When that line, which is the distance from the middle of the Sun to the middle of Venus, when that line is at right angles to the line of sight from the Earth through Venus, this angle is at a maximum. Maximum elongation. The point is that then it is a right angle triangle and so that you then know that the sine of the angle theta is the distance between Venus and the Sun divided by the distance between the Earth and the Sun. It doesn't matter whether you're familiar with what signs are or not. But the fact was, they were. They knew how to use them. And anybody who's ever done, uh, well, it was O-levels in my day, I think it's GCSEs now, isn't it? I can't remember. But anyway, anybody who's ever done any of that would actually know how to use sines and cosines and all that sort of stuff. Point is that it means you can check this regularly. The maximum elongation of Venus happens frequently. And it means you know the ratio of the semi-major axis of Venus's orbit divided by the semi-major axis of the Earth's orbit. In other words, you know the <laughs> you know the um, ratio between the two. You know that Venus's semi-major axis is 0.72 of an AU. <laughs> so <laughs> never had to fight my own echo before. Anyway. So we, 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 know, we know what the ratio is. It's 0 0.72. And if you look at that, notice it's not to scale and how. So there's the sun. There's the earth. There's the two observing points. Now remember, these are rays of light, so they travel straight. So this triangle is the same shape as that triangle. So all the, all the lines on this triangle are 0.72 and all the lines on this triangle are 0.28. That's the ratio between them. If you know that distance, and if you're good navigators, you damn well ought to, you can work out this distance. If you've measured the positions of the transiting planet against the sun, if you know that distance, you can work out the diameter of the sun. So we can calculate how far, how big the sun is. If you know how big the sun is, and you know how big it appears to be, roughly half a degree in diameter, then you can work out how far away it has to be in order to appear half a degree wide as we look at it. You've got the astronomical unit. It's not the only way it was done. Um, I think there were at least five different sets of calculations. And they all came to roughly the same answer, which must have been a great relief. Actually, um, the major um, analyst of all this was the Swiss mathematician Lot Euler, pronounced Euler in the imitation game, but Euler is the correct pronunciation. And that value, 1769, uh, published about 1773, I think, was, in modern terms, 150 million kilometres. And it's never been seriously challenged. It's been refined by, you know, a few hundred, few, even a few thousand kilometres. But that basic value of about 150 million has remained if you if you want it in in miles, it's 93 million. Um, Alan and I were talking about this earlier. 
once you get into millions, I mean, to be honest, do you care whether it's millions of miles or millions of kilometres? I mean, would you know a million kilometres if it came and barked at you? You know, I wouldn't. Anyway, so by the late 18th century, we've got the astronomical unit sorted out. Now remember, the predecessors had done all this geometry. They knew the distances of all the planets in astronomical units. So when we knew the astronomical unit in miles or whatever, suddenly the size of the solar system is clear. And remember, they only had to do it out as far as Saturn because they hadn't discovered any more planets. Although that chap Herschel went and discovered Uranus in 1781, was it? I think it was. Might have been 83, I don't know. Incidentally, there's no point in calling it Uranus because that sounds just as bad. I mean, if you don't like Uranus, call it Uranus. You know, it can't be mistaken for anything. But I prefer to call it Uranus because then you can come out with all the bad jokes, you know. Incidentally, if you're ever in a pub with some astronomers and you want a toast to drink, the astronomer's toast is up Uranus. <laughs> now, OK, we've got the solar system sorted out. And almost it happened like that. Now, I got a, a, a value for the astronomical unit and suddenly we know how far everything is. When Herschel discovered Uranus, immediately they knew it was about 19 astronomical units, they knew how big the astronomical unit was and so on. Roughly doubled the size of the solar system, which I thought. So people began to look and say, well, how far away are the stars? Now, Christian Huygens and Isaac Newton have both attempted an estimate of the distance to the stars. In fact, before the AU was calculated. And uh, although they used rather different methods, they both came to the conclusion that if the average star was roughly the same brightness as the sun, it had to be at least 30,000 times farther from us than the sun is. Now we would now say that was a considerable underestimate. But at the time, what that produced was disbelief. Yeah, you know, that made the universe impossibly big. And then, about 1835, oh, that's pictures of Christian Huygens and Isaac Newton. You see, doesn't, doesn't Isaac Newton look like Brian May? <laughs> so astronomers started to think, well, how can we measure the distance to the stars? And three astronomers in particular were involved in this, Bessel, Struve and Hodgson. Uh, Bessel and Struve were both Germans, although Struve was actually working in the Russian Empire. Bessel was observing from Königsberg. Dreadful place to put an observatory. I mean, Königsberg's cloudy, even compared with Britain. Uh, Struve was at uh, Dorpat, which is in Estonia or Lithuania. I can never remember which one. Uh, no better than Königsberg. Hodgson was at the Cape. And they were going to use parallax, which I'll go on to describe in a minute. So what you do is you sight up a star look at the background stars, measure the position of the star relative to the background stars. Six months later you do it again and you find it's moved a little bit. Not very much. The small amount is small. That expressed as an angle, it will be less than one second of arc. And just to remind you, which I'm sure you all know, a second of arc is a sixtieth of a minute of arc. A minute of arc is a 60th of a degree, and a degree is a 360th of a circle. A 3,600th of a degree, that's one second of arc, is a very, very small angle. Think back to when you were at school and you used a protractor. Half a circle, 180 degrees. A degree looks like a pretty small angle, doesn't it? We're talking about a 3,600th of that. And there is no star that exhibits a parallax as big as one second of arc. 
Uh, that this angular measurement necessitated considerable improvements in telescopes. That's a bit like saying, you know, a steam engine required rethinking a horse-drawn carriage. Yeah, considerable improvement is understating it by a long chalk. It also in, in, in quite needed um, radical improvements in techniques of operation, all of which were coming along. The early 19th century was seething with ideas. You know, they were building the first steam engines. Um, no, not the first steam engines. The first steam engines that could move. First steam engines that were reasonably efficient. The ones with the, uh, proactive pistons and so on. Um, Babbage was inventing computers. In science we were getting spectroscopy. Bunsen had invented the famous burner and telescopes were improving. Just a minor diversion before we go on. I've mentioned Tycho Brahe before and he had come up with the idea of proper motion back in about, certainly by 1600. He only lived to 1601, so he had to have done it by 1600. And it was like this. He found that some of the positions he had for stars did not coincide with those in Ptolemy's Almagest. And the Almagest, you know, was the great panjandrum of the day. And Tycho Brahe was confident of his own positions. And he wasn't going to risk bad-mouthing Ptolemy. So if Ptolemy's positions were different from Tycho's positions, it must be the star's fault. They must have moved. That's lousy logic, but it was the right answer. And of course, once people have accepted this, any star that detectably moves is likely to be closer than stars that don't detectably move. Also, bright stars might be nearer than fainter stars. That's a much less reliable guide, by the way. I mean, after all, um, in Orion, can't see where's John. In Orion, Rigel and Betelgeuse are roughly the same brightness, certainly when they're both bright, because they're both a bit variable. But Rigel is near enough twice as far away as Betelgeuse. So Rigel is actually much brighter, much more luminous. Anyway, there, was, there were reasons for thinking we could identify nearby stars. And if we could identify nearby stars, then the chances of being able to get parallax on those nearby stars was relatively good. If you want to play parallax, it's not very difficult. Hold your arm out and put a finger up. Line the, shut one eye, line the finger up with something, then shut that eye and open the other eye and you find your finger appears to have moved in front of the background. Instead of using two eyes, you use one side of the Earth's orbit and the other side of the Earth's orbit. So, Bessel chose 61 Cygni, known as the flying star because it then had the largest known proper motion. Struve chose Alpha Canis Majoris, or Sirius, and that's the brightest star in the entire sky. So, reasonable chance it was close. Hodgson chose Alpha Centauri. A bright star, uh, which uh, even at that stage they could identify had a somewhat similar spectrum to the Sun. So, Sun type star. They've all three got large proper motions compared with most stars. But 61 Cygni 9 was very much the, the bright, the most rapidly moving. And here we come to priority. This is a, a lesson. Hodgson observed Alpha Centauri from the Cape of Good Hope, and he decided he would bring his observations home and reduce the results when he got home. Do it in comfort, you know, and all that. 
Struva, who was perhaps unduly cautious, decided to do an extra six months of observations. Bessel observed, got down to it, reduced his data and published. The result is that the first measurement of parallax is always listed as Bessel. If I remember correctly, Hodgson had actually completed the observations first, but he hadn't reduced the, the data, so he didn't know. There's a picture of Friedrich Bessel. I think it makes him look like a Napoleonic marshal. I think it's quite a flattering portrait. He probably had to pay a lot for it. Anyway, he got a parallax of just under a third of an arc second. That is an astonishingly small angle. And he worked out, it's not a very di difficult calculation to do, that that is equivalent to a distance of about 690,000 astronomical units. So already the astronomical unit is beginning to feel a bit small. And we're only dealing with nearby stars. So he's done that, he's published, and within a pretty short time, uh, Struva had shown that uh, Sirius was about twice as far away as, um, no, it wasn't as far away as 61 Cygni, but it was about twice as far as Hodgson showed that Alpha Centauri was. So they were all in the same ballpark in terms of distance. Now, Professional astronomers would say that uh, 61 sig 9 is 3.2 parsecs distant, and most amateurs prefer light years, and I prefer light years, because it is irritating to try to convert parsecs into light travel time, but it's dead easy to, to make light years into light travel time. These days the distance is bumped up a little bit, um, Bessel probably didn't quite allow enough for the motion of 61 signal across the sky. Nevertheless, it was a damn good effort. Incidentally, Bessel is of most interesting character. Um, he was the one who first suggested that Uranus was misbehaving in its orbit because there was a more distant planet which was accelerating Uranus for something like 30 years. And then when Uranus overtook it, it was retarding Uranus. And that was what led to the calculations of Leverrier and Adams. And of course, as you all know, nobody in England took any notice of Adams and nobody in France took any notice of Leverrier. And it was in the end left to the uh, Prussian National Observatory at Potsdam to discover Neptune. Uh, Poor old George Biddle Airy, Astronomer Royal, <sighs> came in for some fairly hefty criticism over that. Anyway, heliocentric paradox. There is diagram. Um, notice that what we actually use is half of the angle. So we're using one astronomical unit. So we measure the angle, take half of it, and work out how far away the star is. It's called heliocentric parallax because we're actually measuring this distance, not the distance from the Earth. Not that it makes the slightest bit of difference. You know, if, if the distance is 300,000 astronomical units, whether you're observing it from there or from there, it won't make any difference at all in terms of the distance. Incidentally, the, this six months thing, um, it looks good, but it actually has to be determined empirically. You can't say, I'm going to do it on the 1st of January and the 1st of June. 1st of July, rather. You've got to work it out. You have to work out when the stars reach the maximum on one side and when it's reached the maximum on the other. For a start, the Earth's orbit is not precisely circular. So you have to allow for that. So the star will appear to shift, just like my finger did. So there is a, this is a genuine parallax um, photograph. 
there is a star. Instantly, you may find it difficult to get the night sky to cooperate and produce the two little marks to show you which star you're looking at. But make sure you know what you're up to. And you can see there that it has moved. It didn't move very far. That's one arc second on the same scale. As you can see, it's not moved very far. It's not moved anything like an arc second. The, the, method of, the method of finding it, um, the first method involved a thing called the split objective micrometer. In fact, you didn't cut the objective lens in half. I mean, no one's going to let you cut it. You put another lens into the optical train and you cut that in half, a nice cheap one. And then you can, you can move the two halves about, you move the image slightly and you can actually work out where the star is in relation to all the other stars and you can convert that into an angular separation. The word parsec comes from parallax second and one parsec, which is the abbreviation is PC, will be the distance to a star with a parallax of one arc second. Notice I said would be because there isn't any such star. The nearest star is the third uh, component of the Alpha Centauri system, Proxima Centauri. And that's 4.23, I think it is, light years away. Um, alpha, the main Alpha Centauri bit is a little bit further away. So the nearest star is more than one parsec distance. And one parsec is 3.26 light years. And it, because of the way the geometry has been invented, if you measure the angle in light seconds, arc seconds rather, and then you divide that into one, so you're going to do a fraction into one, so you're going to get a, a larger number, that will give you the distance of the star in parsecs. It's one of the few easy conversions in astronomy. It's absolutely dead straightforward. And around about the same time, 1838 was when Bessel measured the parallax, and he actually invented the light year. But there was a problem. The speed of light wasn't known at all accurately. I mean, 17 minutes to cross the diameter of the Earth's orbit is not really very helpful. And they weren't even sure it was 17 minutes. So the parsec became popular. As I've already suggested, I think it's also popular with astronomers because nobody else knows about it and you can feel ever so smug and say, oh, don't you understand parsecs? Oh. If you've ever been to an astronomical uh, press briefing, you can see the smugness as they explain parsecs every bloody time. I think it's a waste of effort myself, but there we are. A parsec is 200, 206,265 AU. If you want to know where that comes from, it's the number of arc seconds in a radian. So there you are. A light year is only 63,241. You see, it's smaller. Now, I don't know if any of you have encountered this, but I, I encounter it at least every other year. Somebody will say, well, 3.26 is nearly pi. So it must be significant. No, it's not. It's just a conversion factor, like kilometres to miles or whatever. Stones to kilograms. I still can't remember that one. There's a lovely odd coincidence which Patrick Moore pointed out to me, and that is that one inch to one mile is almost the same ratio. So if, you, if you're drawing a thing to scale, if you have one inch to one mile, you know, one, one inch is the distance between two objects, and that's your scale, then 
sun to Proxima would be four and a quarter miles. It's a long way. I don't know if you've ever tried uh, mapping out on the ground the scale of the local universe. But you actually have to walk quite a long way. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a couple of hundred yards, it's four and a quarter miles to the nearest star. So after 1838, after Bessel published, there was quite a lot of activity. They did quite a lot of parallaxes and they failed to measure quite a lot of parallaxes as well. And then, of course, in 1846, Gala and De Rest spotted Neptune. And that brought the focus back to the solar system. Now, that's 1846. As the century went on, in particular, spectroscopy was improving out of all recognition. And it got to the stage where it was a really precise science. And that meant that you could look at a star, a distant star, and you could get a spectrum, and you can say, well, that spectrum is a dead ringer for this other star over here. And we already know how far away that one is. So if you know how much brighter this one is than that one, and you know how far that one is away, and you think they're the same sort of stars, you can work out how far this one is. And that's known as spectroscopic parallax. It's got actually nothing to do with parallax, but never mind. But it did become possible, and it, it is still used. Yeah, as I said, estimates of relative brightness were reliable. Um, people who are good at this sort of thing can do relative brightness to 0.1 of a magnitude just by looking at it. I found this out when uh, a chap I used to drink in, in a pub, I can't remember what the pub, Green something or other, Green Man probably, in Butlersbury in the city of London. And he decided to take up a, a bit more serious astronomy, so he went into variable stars. And he was good at it. Bugger. He could estimate to, you know, 0.1 of a magnitude, just like that. I couldn't. I didn't speak to him for weeks. So, if you can do that sort of thing, and they were good at it, and they still are, um, you could calculate the distance to the farther star, and so on. Now, parallax measurement continued to improve for quite a long time and it proved a very effective tool for astronomers and also measurements of proper motion got better and better so the dif difference between proper motion and parallax motion became clearer and clearer but the basic problem never went away and that is, the further away the star is, the smaller the angle. Now, it's not likely that your errors are going to get smaller as the angle gets smaller. So your relative er errors are getting bigger and bigger all the time, which was a nuisance. And of course, in the end, it was the Earth's atmosphere that upset the apple cart. Remember that the Earth's atmosphere is neither uniform nor stationary, it wobbles around. That's what we call twinkling when we look at stars. But it means that there is a limit to how accurately you can determine the position of a star. And once that tolerance around its position exceeds the parallax angle, you can't measure the parallax angle. Another problem which I was very surprised about, but it is true. A lot of bright stars are bright because they are big. Literally big. Betelgeuse is a classic example. Betelgeuse is bigger than the orbit of Jupiter. That's pretty big. They're so big that their size on the sky is comparable to their parallax angle, so we can't measure it. So although Betelgeuse isn't really that far away, you'll find that almost every reference source gives a different distance. I just picked the one I like best, which is 470 light years. I don't think it's right. I mean, just, just accept it. But 
with all these limitations, and hopefully people were reasonably honest about uncertainties, they're not usually, but sometimes they are, it was possible to get some idea of the size, not really of our galaxy, but of the region around us. But going on really did require a change of approach. And this became important in 1912, and that was the year the Titanic sank. Um, I may have a distorted sense of priorities, but I, I think what I'm going to tell you about was more important than the sinking of the Titanic. Less tragic as well. This lady, Henrietta Levitt, she was a computer. They sometimes spell it as computer, O-R, which I think is a good idea because it distinguishes between a person and a machine. And they were, there were lots of them, and they're mostly women, usually women from good families who'd had good educations and wanted to use their education. And they worked at Harvard University for the observatory. Many of them were unpaid, and those who were paid were paid very poorly. And their job was to reduce data. Because you'd use a laptop now. In those days, it had to be done with teams of people writing on paper. It's actually where the spreadsheet was invented. Each person was a cell, and spreadsheet was where you kept records of it. And that got transferred to a computer. The transfer to a computer, of course, happened much more recently. Uh, Henrietta Levitt was rather deaf. She had had scarlet fever and this had affected her hearing. The director said somewhat bitterly that she seemed to be a lot deafer when he wanted her to do something she didn't want to do. That's what my mother used to say about my father. And one of the lady computers actually commented, nice little uh, epigram there, lecturers work for labourers pay. That's those, of course not all of them were even paid. What Henrietta Levitt was doing was looking at the small Magellanic cloud. I'm told that looks like a hedgehog. Personally, I can't see it, but there we are. And I mean, it's just, you know, it's just a fuzzy blob in the sky. But already the telescopes were good enough that you could see individual stars in this. Now, Levitt realised that the SMC is so far away that only the very brightest stars could be seen individually. That meant that all of the stars in the small Magellanic cloud could be regarded as being at the same distance. The variation in distance will be trivial compared with the whole distance. So a star that appeared brighter in the cloud would be more luminous. The star that appeared fainter would be less luminous. Oh, that's a picture of the computers at work. Um, I don't think they normally worked quite as cramped up as that, but that was presumably to get them in the picture. If I'm correct, that's Henrietta Levitt, and I think that's Annie Jump Cannon. Wonderful name, isn't it? Annie Jump Cannon. OK, so Henrietta Levitt could pick out these bright stars in the small Magellanic cloud and graded them accordingly. And then she noticed that some of them were varying. They were brighter in one picture than they were in the next. And she was able to work out that some of them varied you know, they got brighter, and then they got fainter, and then they got brighter again. And she worked out that the brightest ones varied more slowly. We now know why that is. They're slightly bigger. So it takes longer to vary. So they became known as Cephids, because some, or Cephids, pronounce it how you like, because somebody had already worked out that the star Delta, Cephi, was, I, was varying like that. Now, what this meant, eventually, was that Levitt could propose a period-luminosity relationship. 
if it's the right sort of star and it varies in 72 days, you knew approximately how luminous it was. If you knew how luminous it was and you knew how bright it appeared, you can calculate how far away it is. And of course, you know, initially it was just well, like, the ones with the largest, with the, with the longest periods have, have the brightest, uh, are the brightest stars and so on, the absolute magnitudes and so on. Nowadays we have an up-to-date version. It doesn't really matter. I stuck that in for a laugh. I don't suppose any of you are going to sit down and calculate all these things for yourselves. This is from Levitt's paper of 1912. And here are the... On the horizontal axis is the logarithm of the period in days. And up here is the magnitude. Remember that magnitudes go the wrong way round. Oh, high magnitudes are faint, low magnitudes are bright. And for each individual star you've got a peak magnitude and a minimum magnitude. And you can see that you can draw rough lines through those. It's not tremendously accurate, it's good enough. And in fact it, the whole thing's been refined over years. And then in 1923, Hubble discovered a CFID variable in M31. And suddenly the universe went like that. Huge change in distance. At first he just thought it was a nova, you know, a star that kind of blows up. Not, not like a supernova, which is a real explosion. But what this did prove was that M31 was too far away to be part of our galaxy. It had to be an independent stellar system and the word galaxy came into use. Um, before that, island universe was more popular. And of course, most of the supernovae that were seen, sorry, most of the CFIs that were seen were in spiral galaxies, or known as spiral nebulae in those days. <coughs> Just a reminder there that the universe contains about 100 billion large galaxies, each of which contains more than 100 billion stars. That'll just give you an idea of roughly how many stars there might be in the universe. Completely useless piece of information, but there you are. Okay. There's a picture of Levitt working at her desk. She's got a bit more room this time, isn't she? This is one of the great Hubble Space Telescope pictures. It's of M100. You can see it's got all the classic things. Beautiful spiral, blue arms because they're young stars, which tend to be blue. The hot ones are blue and a yellowish centre because you've got, although there are a lot more stars in the centre, uh, they're older stars, they're smaller, less massive, and they tend to be yellowish in colour or even orange or red. But in this galaxy, they managed to find pictures of single stars. At least one of them was a yellow supergiant, so it was a good candidate to be a CFID. And when they worked out that it varied, they were pretty sure it was a CFID. So there we are. There is, there is the overall picture. There's the square where they found the star. And you can see in three separate pictures, brighter, fainter, a lot fainter. You follow it through the cycle. It doesn't matter if you only get the brightest bits. You know, if you get the maximum and then it fades and you can't see it, and you only get the next maximum, you've still got the period of the variability. Now, in the meantime, other people were trying to calibrate Levitt's discovery. <laughs> this was hard work. Because it turned out there's more than one kind of star that will vary in this way. But, in the end, it was possible to identify CFID variables in external galaxies and measure the distances. 
or measure the periods and estimate their distances. Because the knowledge of the period will give us the actual luminosity of the star. You can measure its actual brightness, compare the two, and you've got the distance. But notice that's very different from parallax. Many people have claimed this to be the most important astronomical discovery of the 20th century, and I think I would go along with that. Because this was the one that changed the universe. From everything belongs to a single collection of stars to there are millions and then billions of galaxies. That's the universe we live in now. So it gives you distances like two and a half million light years to M31, that's 0.8 megaparsecs. Megaparsec, of course, is a million parsecs. Three million to M33 and so on. This works out so far to a distance of something like 50 megaparsecs. So beyond the centre of the Virgo cluster, which is our, our local cluster, we are the hicks from the sticks. We come from the out, outer limits of the Virgo cluster. There's the Harvard computers standing in front of the building. And this chap with a strange hairstyle is Edward Pickering. And he usually wears a sort of Mississippi gambler's hat, but he didn't in that. There's a picture of Henrietta Levitt in 1921. That's the year she died. Uh, I think she looked pretty feeble in that picture. Frail, perhaps is a better way of putting it. Uh, she's sitting at a desk. There's a, a light box here, and she's got a microscope to look at it, and you would put a, uh, a plate over there, and you could then examine it in great care. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever tried looking at a plate on a light box. If you haven't, it's a good thing to avoid doing. It's an absolutely marvellous way to get migraine. Even people who don't normally have migraines will get migraines that way. But from a discovery to a practical method is a long job. The discovery was 1912. But it took a long time to identify seafids that were near enough for their parallax to be detected or to find stars with known parallaxes that could be classified as seafids. Now I said they're yellow supergiant stars, but yellow supergiants are comparatively rare, say one in a million stars. This explains why they were found in the small Magellanic cloud, because you've got millions of stars in a little tiny bit of space. Oops. So, I said calibration was difficult. That's because there are more than one type of star that will do this variation. The most notorious is what used to be called cluster seafids. They look like seafids, they're yellow stars. They vary over roughly the same sort of periods. But cluster seafids are only about 1% of the luminosity of classical seafids. And trying to tell the difference when you didn't know there were two different types of star was a touch on the difficult side. Now, for instance, my parents bought me Patrick Moore's Boy's Book of Astronomy. How many of you had a copy of that? Uh, you see, got to be my age to have had that. <laughs> I lost it. Well, it had already fallen apart. It was in an envelope in such a state, but I lost it years ago. I think it was 1958 I got that. And the distance to M31 in Andromeda was given as 800,000 light years then. Because we now take three and a, two and a half million. That's not the expansion of the universe. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that, but there will, you will always encounter someone who will do that, yeah. And... 
that difference is all down to the problem of calibration. I don't think that 2,500,000 that 2, is going to change now because I think they've got the calibration sorted out. But, you know, it was a hell of a job. Um, I think we will skip... So I want to get on to... Type 1A Supernovae. Whoops. Type 1A Supernovae are regarded as standard candles. That's what a, a CFID is. That is something where you can get an independent estimate of its luminosity. And if you can measure its brightness, you know how far away it is. Type 1A Supernovae occur when accretion onto a white dwarf raises its mass above the chandra shikhar limit and it explodes. It's literally an explosion. The accretion is usually from a companion star. And the chandra shikhar limit, oddly enough, invented by this chap chandra shikhar, is the maximum mass that a white dwarf can have and remain a white dwarf. If you increase its mass beyond that, it will collapse. And here is a supernova in M82, and this picture was taken a few days after the discovery by a team at uh, the UCL Observatory at Mill Hill. And this picture was taken by a student of mine with an 8-inch Mead telescope, and there's the, there's the supernova. So it actually wasn't a difficult object to find at all. Why is this significant? Well, if this Chandra Shikhar limit thing works, then the explosion luminosity is going to be the same every time. Well, they soon worked out that that wasn't quite going to be true because the, um, the composition of the white dwarf will make a small difference. But nevertheless, it was felt that this would be pretty accurate. And that led us, I'm skipping over how the thermonuclear reactions blow the star apart. The white dwarf is entirely destroyed and so on. But this explosion was regarded as producing a reliable luminosity. And they started using this to estimate distances to distant galaxies. And from that came the current idea that the universe is not merely expanding, but that the rate of expansion is accelerating, which is amazing. The Nobel Committee awarded prizes to three astronomers. I can only remember Saul Perlmutter's name. Uh, two others. So, you know, that sort of, that's your blue ribbon, isn't it? That's your certificate that you put on the wall. Or as Fred, Fred Hoyle said to uh, Willie Fowler, take the money and run. Now, funnily enough, there has always been, amongst observational astronomers, a doubt whether this is valid. Peter Meikle, who was the dean of supernova observations. He worked in, I think it was Imperial College. And he said, way before the Nobel Prize Committee, that the brightest 1As was something like 10 times brighter than the faintest. That is too big a difference to be used as a standard candle. Um, this is becoming more accepted. But the Nobel Prize is a huge barrier. It's very difficult to argue against something that's got a Nobel Prize. But they have come up with some scenarios which could explain it. A big enough nova could detonate the star to become a supernova, even though it wasn't actually 
past the Chandra Shikhar limit, two white dwarfs could bash into one another, thus producing an explosion with about twice the mass, which would be a lot brighter. So there are doubts, let's say, about that. Um, whether the doubts are right or the Nobel Committee was right, I don't really care. The point is that we have to find out. And there is work going on. In fact, every um, National Astronomy meeting I've been to for the last five years has had at least one afternoon of accelerating universe bashing. That is, type 1a supernovae are not standard candles. And this is the most distant object known. As you can see, like most of these things, it's got a wonderfully romantic name. And it's thought to be about 13.6 billion light years away. So you are looking at something as it was when the universe was about 200 million years old. I mean, don't take those numbers all that seriously. But they still give you an idea. So the scale of the universe over a few hundred years has gone from the sun is probably 20 million miles away to the radius of the visible universe is about 13.86 billion light years. That's pretty good going, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's a hell of a change in just a few hundred years. You know, 1600 to now. Whoops. I don't know why that sounded as bad as I thought it was going to. Anyway. So there we are. I was going to, well, I'll just show you one more slide. It's calibrated in parsecs because it was produced by a professional astronomer. <coughs> but you can see all the different methods, parallax, spectroscopic methods, CFID variables. Tully Fisher and the fundamental plane work by identifying what sort of galaxy it is and, and seeing if you can estimate how bright it is. Then you have the type 1a supernovae, then you have the brightest cluster galaxy. That that's getting to be um, discounted these days. And you can have Hubble's law, which means you just measure the redshift and say, oh, we can convert that to a distance. Yeah, you can. But the accuracy they claim, and they, they generally, I showed you that one, they're giving you four significant figures for a conversion of a redshift into a distance. Yeah, I mean, the data just doesn't support it. Two significant figures would be a lot. Four is just over-egging the pudding. But nevertheless, it's quite a big universe, isn't it? A bit bigger than we thought it was. I don't think it's going to change. I think we've actually got that bit sussed. But you know there is a suspicion now that our universe may just be a bubble in a larger multiverse, or whatever you like to call it. There is even a bit of evidence for this. There's a thing called the cold spot, and somebody said, well, it might be that our universe has bumped into another universe with a slightly different set of characteristics, and energy is leaking through the cold spot into this other universe. I think I'd better shut up there, don't you? <laughs> Our minds. Well, I hope so. That's what it's supposed to do, isn't it? <laughs> Obviously, a very big thank you for preparing that. May I say, um, ask if there are questions from the floor? If you could put your hands up, and I'll ask Roger to repeat them into the microphones okay, so that the people on Zoom can hear the question. So, do we have any questions? Who's going to go first? By the way, people on Zoom, do send your questions in via the chat facility, please. Look at that, a shot. Yes? Go on, then. 
Yep, yeah, go ahead. The size of the universe, uh, the speed with which we can travel through the universe, and the uh, uh, susceptibility of uh, radiation pollution to the human body, we're just not going to get past Mars or the moon. Right, well, the question is, um, you know, the universe is so big and we can't travel very quickly. Are we ever going to get past Mars? There are methods which, if we were prepared to spend the money, we might be able to do it. Um, I personally think the money could probably be spent better on other things. Um, I would prefer to see us using robots to do exploration for the foreseeable future. I mean, Elon Musk said that they're going to launch for Mars in four years. Yeah, well, I'll believe that when I see it. I mean, what he's... Hmm? Musk just wants to invest his money. Well, yeah. He doesn't care about actually going to Mars. Well, I don't know. He's, he's very keen on launching. I mean, he's always sending rockets up, and they keep going up and going off. I mean, it's it's quite exciting to watch. I don't know about you. But... One way to it, yeah. yeah. They get a bit further each time. Well, though. yeah. I mean, I, when when old Trump said he wanted to reinvigorate America, I mean, I I came up with the idea that he ought to personally lead a one-way trip to Mars. <laughs> but he doesn't seem very keen on that. I've, I thought it was a perfect answer myself, you know. Yeah, Leon. Well, bearing in mind that they've done, they're getting a lot of research about the effect on kidneys when you go into space, it's highly unlikely that anybody's going to survive. Yeah, well, I mean, you don't even need to do the research. I mean, all you've got to do is look at the Look at the, the news reel. When they come down from the space station after a six month tour of duty, they can't even get out of the capsule unaided. Now, the minimum trip to Mars at the moment is nine months. That's three months longer than the long stay on the space station. Yeah, I mean, what's the use of landing an astronaut on Mars who can't get out of the capsule? I know the gravity's only one third. <laughs> Wouldn't be so hard. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, yeah, are you, can you imagine? The, the, I mean, uh, they're, they're going to be like me, you know, they're going to be arthritic. And, <laughs> load of cobblers. They've got to, I mean, first of all, they've got to find a method of producing art. Well, I mean, we all know what it is artificial gravity. We've just got to make a spaceship that's big enough to be spun. Does anybody remember the Fon Brown film? Something like Destination Mars, it was called. Fantastic. 13 spaceships going to Mars in a fleet. Halfway there, they would swap the crews around so they wouldn't kill one another. <laughs> what a brilliant idea. I think he reckoned it would cost the same as something like 3,000 Berlin airlifts. Cheap at double the price, I would have said. There's a question up there. Ah, that's John, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The, the so called cost, uh, technology that we're using to get Hmm. But if it's doubt about whether the 180 supernovas are alive or can be, surely that means that tension doesn't really exist. Well, um, sorry, yeah, the, the, the tension, the question is about the tension between um, rates of expansion for the universe, which have been de derived from the observations of the microwave background, and rates that have been derived from either type 1a supernovas or C feed variables or anything anything of those. Um, in each case you've got not one value but a block of values. 
each group that supports one or the other value maintains that the uncertainties in their value do not include the other block's values. So somebody's going to be wrong. The only thing we've got to go on is the high hubblers and the low hubblers, which was about 15 years ago. And the one thing they were sure of was that the ultimate value would not be in the middle. The high hubblers said around about 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and the low hubblers said about 45. The values we're getting now are around about 70. That's in the middle. At least I think it is. I mean, perhaps I've got it wrong. I don't know. I would guess that the, re the resolution of the tension is going to be somewhere between the sort of 68, which is the microwave, and the 73, 74, which is the other one. Um, there are signs of movement. Uh, Wendy Friedman um, is working on using red giants rather than yellow supergiants because apparently they're more reliably estimated. Okay. Um, so we'll have to see what it turns out like. I think I'll have to call a halt to questions from the floor. Do we have any questions on the internet? Uh, just a couple of um, compliments uh, from, from Jerry. Uh, 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 very interesting and uh, an understandable presentation. Well done, Roger. That was from uh, Jerry. He, meant, he makes a mention of Island Zero, which can take crews to Mars and leave them accustomed to Mars gravity on arrival through simulated gravity. Um, I'd like to see what the budget for that is. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I, I think we will all agree that that was an absolutely fascinating talk. And I'm sure we all want to say thank you very much indeed to everyone. Of course, thank you for listening. <laughs> OK, just to wind up the meeting, um, those of you who've got a handout may have noticed on it, it says a session on my telescope doesn't work on the 5th of October. Um, a committee feel that um, you may know that Jerry hasn't been too well recently, so we'll postpone that one for the moment. If, however, you do have a telescope that you're, you were really dying to have a go at getting started with and you're having problems, please just drop us a note and we'll do our best to help you out before um, this next session is arranged. A um, couple of more dates for you. On the 9th of October, here, um, is our next meeting, our next uh, full club meeting like tonight, where we've got a talk on Raman spectroscopy and the search for life in the solar system. Samantha Rolf is going to give that talk, so I'm sure that's going to be fascinating. And on the 15th, Tuesday the 15th of October, everybody who is a member of our club, you are invited to come along to Hagas. That's our astrophotography section of our club. Now, they usually have met in the past in Hoddesdon, but they are now transferring also to here to the university. At the moment, we are not 100% sure whether it's going to be this room or another, but we will put notice of that on the website once we, uh, we can confirm it. But that's on the 15th of October, and they've got a talk via Zoom from Dodie Regan, who's going to be talking about um, the skies over Texas. Obviously, she is in America, and it's going to be a live uh, Zoom meeting on that one. So, 15th of uh, October. That's all I need to say tonight, other than to say thank you, obviously, to the team um, for battling through all the technical difficulties that seem to have all crept out of the woodwork. Have you got a message for us? Yes, I want uh, the 
two gentlemen that paid cash. Ah, two people who paid cash. Uh, I believe you owed some change, so all of you who want the change, please form an orderly queue <laughs> and prove why you deserve it. <laughs> Other than that, I'd like to say thank you all of you for coming along. All of you on Zoom, I saw we had about 20 people on Zoom this evening, so we hope you've enjoyed it too. And may you have a safe journey home, and I look forward to seeing you at one of our future meetings. Thank you and good night.